Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jurors Lecture for Young Contemporaries 2021, featuring Bob Sneed. My name is Brian Granger, and I am the Director of Exhibitions at the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art. Tonight, you will hear from Bob Sneed, the juror for this year's Young Contemporaries, which is our annual juried student exhibition presented by the Studio Art Department Hello, at the School of the Arts. Welcome to the Jurors Lecture. Uh, at the College of Charleston, along with the Halsey Institute. Young Contemporaries accepts submissions from any student at the college. And I'm always really excited about the exhibition as it reflects the strength and diversity of practice in the School of the Arts rigorous programs. The exhibition will open to the public on Friday, May, uh, March 26th. Um, to stay within the College of Charleston's COVID-19 protocols. Uh, the opening reception and award ceremony will take place on Instagram Live um, that day at 5 p.m. And so stay tuned for more information on that. I also want to thank the Marilyn and John Hill Studio Art Support Fund and the Francis Gimbel God Endowed Fund for supporting Bob's visit and lecture tonight. And thanks also to the studio art department for coordinating his day and his time here. And one quick note about tonight's virtual lecture. We are pleased to offer this to the public via Halsey Live. But simultaneously, we are also happy to have students uh, from the thesis class in the Zoom with us tonight. So we will have a Q&A at the end. So if you are watching from Halsey Live, go ahead and use the form right below the video to send us a question. Um, when we'll be able to get, to get to those by the end of the talk. And now to introduce our juror tonight, Bob Sneed is a native of Charleston, South Carolina, where he graduated cum laude from the College of Charleston in 2002. Soon after he helped found Redux Contemporary Arts Center and remained uh, as the director of it until 2005, when he left to pursue graduate studies at Yale University School of Art. After receiving his MFA, he helped form the Traveling Artist Collective, Transit Antenna, and spent the next two years developing community-based art projects across North America. From 2010 to 2020, he lived and worked in New Orleans helping to grow the community-based art organization Antenna as executive director, in addition to acting as the executive producer for Dred Scott's Slave Rebellion reenactment in 2019, founding the Platforms Fund in 2015, and directing the 2013 Hand in Glove Conference. He now continues a rigorous art practice in Barnwell, South Carolina, having exhibited work um, all around the country, including places like the Whitney Museum, Deitch Projects, or the Jack Tilton Gallery, the Aldrich Contemporary Arts Center, Georgia Southern University, the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans, Arthur Roger Gallery, uh, LSU, amongst many others. So please help me welcome Bob Sneed. Thanks, y'all. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this will work okay. And hopefully I don't freeze because uh, I am, it, it keeps in and out saying connection, so, which it's not unsimilar to me as a human. <laughs> um, let's see here, so share screen. So um, I, I always like to start uh, with this project. Um, this was a piece uh, that I'd actually started in um, Charleston uh, right before grad school and then, uh, and then kind of finished uh, in grad school. So really trying to um, talk about the uh, relationship uh, with uh, a complicated relationship with my with my my parents, and 
uh, particularly my father. And uh, I um, worked on this piece uh, throughout that time. And then actually uh, my dad passed away and uh, I, I created kind of an addendum uh, to the project. So, And I might be going too fast for people to read, but hopefully not. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, kind of re-modified the, the project to really speak to the um, to death and the kind of uh, uh, strained relationship that we had at the end. Um, and really, you know, all of all of this work uh, from this time period and 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 still is. is I'm trying to uh, replicate or 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 uh, connect to the relationships um, that that I have with um, with family, with objects. Um, really trying to um, display like what what um, what domestic life is in America um, and complicate that. It's really weird because this, you know, for a, a live audience, um, I can usually gauge like uh, a little bit of laughter. <laughs> it's odd, it's odd getting it, uh, getting it now uh, with no, with no laugh track. Um, but nonetheless, I know that maybe some of you are chuckling inside, um, awkwardly. So, um, I, growing up, I, I really, uh, you know, as a kid, I wanted to be an artist. Um, I really loved the work of Robert Arneson. I was actually talking to Sarah earlier a little bit about Arneson. Um, and, uh, I actually saw this piece in a, a scholastic, um artist uh pamphlet they they would give out these like pamphlets of artists and really fell in love with his work um and the sort of self-deprecating uh nature of the the work he was creating um and these beautiful like sculptures so I, in in undergrad i was actually making uh self-portraits out of clay uh as well um, this is a piece that, uh, you know, he, he had, towards the end of his life, uh, dealing with uh, cancer, all of the kind of breathing in of, of uh, toxins and clay. Uh, and then I also really love uh, stand-up comedy. So um, it was a mix of these kind of influences. Um, this particular set is one that... Um, is, is one that I've, you know, I've always uh, come back to. It's a set that um, Richard Pryor did uh, after he uh, uh, attempted suicide and set himself on fire and uh, did this really beautiful set um, kind of weaving through the, the complications of, of that in his mindset. And um, I'll just play like a tiny clip of this. So you can watch it, I think it's on, it's on Netflix nowadays. We all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass too. Oh yeah, y'all didn't think I saw so many of these motherfuckers. You love me so much. I remember this one. It's straight to match like this. Like, What's that? Richard Pry running down the street. Um and uh so in undergrad I was making these kind of projects that mix these uh, influences. I was just talking to Herb and he was saying that he, yeah, he still owns one of these. So this is uh, Bob in a Bag. Um, that was a sculpture that I made in undergrad. Um, uh, it was like a cast polyurethane uh, rubber. Um, you, you, could you had instructions on how to mount your Bob uh, on the wall and um, it came in a bag kind of referencing body bags and desks and all those things, um, and I was also I also made Bob in a box, 
And this actually went in the Ardo mat, which the Halsey uh, has one of. Um, uh, so that there, at one point it was in the in the Ardo mat. Um, I haven't made these in uh, more almost twenty years, but uh, um, yeah, made them in all different colors. And there was a special edition uh, that was uh, out of bronze. Um, and this was also like learning how to make things. So it was just like making these objects, you know, while also learning how to cast plastic, cast bronze. Um, and then these kind of never made, made the cut. Um, uh, Bob Vila in a box and Bob Dobb. Crush uh, Eater, um, Prince, uh, also like with this, this kind of mindset. Um, and then paintings, uh, you know, kind of referencing the reality that um, and uh, kind of barrel through college um, regardless. And uh, made these um, pieces too of uh, referencing family and the kind of work life. Um, that I was uh, existing with. Uh, you can see there I was, I was a FedEx driver for a time. Um, so for about a year, I was a, I was a FedEx driver. Um, and, uh, and then of course my wife was the boss lady, always is, still is. Um, yeah, you don't have to be pregnant to eat for two. Um, still, still true today, but you could have two hamburgers, no big deal. Um, and then I was also doing these paintings of friends. So, um, uh, you know, kind of referencing their inner, inner world, their inner skeletons, the, the kind of things that, that made, that, that made me laugh about them. Uh, and at the same time we were starting Redux. Um, uh, this was like right after, well, actually in, in, uh, at the college, we, uh, started Untitled Gallery. It was while we were still in school, and that was the kind of predecessor to um, to Redux. A lot of the same crew uh, ended up um, uh, starting Redux. So, but uh, Untitled was this free space that the um, uh, the waterfront uh, out by the aquarium that gave us a free uh, a space to do uh, whatever we wanted with. So, it was a group of um, about five of us that uh, were the core of uh, running that space, and then that translated into starting to meet up. Um, these are kind of earlier pictures, uh, studio spaces. Most of y'all know, um, I would hope most of y'all know about Rita. There's, I think there's now they, in their newer space, they have 40 plus uh, res or studios um, that you can rent. Um, and then when we first started, we were, we were really excited about having a kind of multidisciplinary venue. So we had a lot of performances early on. Um, and during that, I was also making these posters. So uh, I really love uh, printmaking. Um, and uh, when I was at the college, so uh, taught myself how to do a silk screen after school and then I uh, started making these posters for all the shows that we were hosting at Redux. Um, and then this was a show that we, uh, in the old space, we closed the old space down uh, with the last show and kind of tried to bring back as many folks as possible um, to make that happen. So this was the last exhibition. Uh, we took at the opening, which some of y'all are in there, I think. And this was er earlier on. So this was uh, Dalek. Um, uh, actually, one of the other, uh, one of my students, uh, when I taught for a bit at the College of Charleston, um, uh, Seth Curcio, uh, ended up running the uh, Redux after me and, um, and brought in some really incredible shows. So it's been a it's been a, a great space to, um, to, to have this, to ha or at least it, it has in the past brought a, a bunch of awesome 
kind of energy from the college. Um, and, uh, and then of course we had uh, in the space, it also, you know, I started uh, doing work based on the people that had studios. This is Daryl. Um, and then we also, for fundraisers and stuff, we would, we would make art to like raise money. So this was a show that we did, part of a show uh, called Hot Artists Take It Off. Um, it was um, not a great fundraiser because uh, it was all nude self-portraits, um, but we were raising money for an air conditioning unit. And, uh, and so we had fun with it. Um, I think that this piece, um, uh, so Mindy Seltzer, who one of the, the, pri the prizes for um, the exhibition, it's named after her husband, Norton. They bought this piece uh, and, uh, and then returned it. <laughs> they, their, kids, their kids wouldn't let them live with it. <laughs> so um, it ended up going to another home. I don't remember where. But then this was, uh, this was Michael Gray. Um, who who saw that painting and uh, and then start like recommend he's like why are you getting your wife to like shave your back like there's black magic out there and you don't need to do that so um so then I think about his recommendation uh, for black magic um and then you know towards the end of uh, my time there a, a, a group of us at, that started Redux we were we were kind of to the point of burnout and we all kind of mass exodus out of the city. Um, and I got into Yale, which at the time it felt like, uh, you know, my future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. That was like sort of the, the song for this painting. Um, you know, down the road, I also, at the same, you know, moment, I also felt like totally sick about this kind of move and, and getting that comfort zone of Charleston. Um, I think Marion Mazzoni on this piece is the, she's in the art history department down there. And yeah, and then kind of uh, in grad school had the, the shock of, you know, going from suburban to urban, having to, to look at my dog's butt a lot um, and walking him around. and. And uh, yeah, and then kind of innerly reflecting on um, existence and like, why the hell was I doing anything at all? <laughs> why was I making things? Um, that's what grad school does. It makes you question it all. And at the same time, it was at this moment where um, uh, the Wall Street Journal had uh, made this uh, or had this article the, the semester before I got there that was uh, it basically said that um, you know investment in Yale artists were, on average was be a better investment than any other grad school students and so there became this uh, weird hedge fund frenzy um, in, in my first year of grad school and this was kind of replicating that. So this was, um, this is called the Pimp and John Freeman. Um, and uh, it's a, a gallerist. And then uh, John, John Freeman is uh, a hedge funder. And both of them were, were uh, touring the, the, um, the, the studios quite a bit and, and essentially like collecting every, like hedging with, with every studio artist um, in the in the entire school, so getting a piece from every artist, and it felt weird and gross. And so I was also making like feeling feeling kind of regret for leaving or for for uh, coming to this thing at that at that moment. In the background, you can't really see it, but uh, I have a drawing of Redux on fire. <laughs> <laughs> like a little tiny like thing at the time there was just like this chaos and leadership and it felt like what was I doing I don't know and so I at the second year in grad school I created this project um 
that uh, was an ATM machine uh, that no longer wanted to be an ATM machine and wanted to instead become a stand-up comedian. And so uh, I took him around town uh, to, to open mics um, all around New Haven. Um, and uh, there's a set online that you can, that you can watch if, if you're interested, uh, ATM Live. Um, which is, it's weird because, you know, this was before the banking crisis. He could have, he could have had a whole nother kind of life in the banking crisis um, had, I, had I really wanted to resurrect him. Um, did a project with uh, Dyke's Project um, with their art parade, uh, pro, pro Walmart rally. Um, this was at a moment when Walmart was uh, trying to make a, get a foothold in, in um, Manhattan and never really happened, but, um, but we, we had a, a group of about a hundred folks who, um, who wanted to supposedly have a Walmart in, in the park. Very obviously tongue in cheek. Um, and then uh, second year of kind of working with Deitch, I did a project with um, collaborator Seth Gadsden, who's also a, um, a College of Charleston alum, where we attempted to lift uh, Jeffrey Deitch with uh, regular sized party balloons um, and totally failed. So this was a massive failure. Um, where he did not really get any air, though he did, we did get to see him uh, jump around like a chicken attempting to get air. And, you know, in hindsight, that was probably better than actually him getting air. But at the time, it was, uh, it was misery. We, um, we felt like complete failures and not making this thing happen. And it was this kind of confluence of all of these things going wrong, sort of the building of a fiasco. Um, thank God no one got hurt. It was just, we just, he just didn't catch air. And then that, um, uh, Seth and myself and our families and another a couple uh, decided to um, jump in a bus and travel cross country with, uh, with you know our our everything that we had um, kind of packed up in a bus, um, built out the space to live and work, um, using our construction and sculpture skills to to build out the the space. Um, we lived and worked um, cross country for two years. Uh, did various projects. We also ran the bus on waste vegetable oil. So uh, we built the system to do that um, with a lot of uh, help on, uh, on web forums on doing that. Um, and then also kept making, making work uh, based on that. So this is kind of a, a painting based on the, on the oil system. Um, this was a moment uh, with Seth and Jamie uh, making a complete mess uh, with oil all over a parking lot. Um, we had a lot of those moments. Um, and then we created this series uh, uh, 360 and change and had um, uh, these eight by eight uh, paintings and drawings and, and uh, fabric pieces that we created along the way. Um, so these are a few of the paintings that I created um, during that time. And this, uh, still, I'm still good friends with Alex. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a piece that you can't really see on the side um, that's painted in clear that says, kind of looks like the dude from Memento. Um, if you remember, uh, which he, yeah, he, he, has, he has the look of that guy. Um, drank a lot of concentrate because um, we, did, we didn't have the space for, for full jugs of things. And we did these projects across the country. So um, this project was uh, to sail the Salton Sea. And we, um, in Southern California, we uh, took the, to this body of water um, that uh, is, is a fairly abandoned body of water. Uh, 
and uh, used to be sort of a vacation spot, um, sort of a Lake Tahoe kind of place. And then uh, started having these mass red tides uh, in the 80s, 90s, and um, has become a really depressing site um, now where the salt content so high in the water that they, the fish die off every summer. Um, and so uh, no one uses the, there's a lot of stigma on, uh, with the body of water. So when we got, when we found this place, uh, we decided we would build a junket boat um, out of scrap material and sail across. Um, it's about a 15 mile uh, across trek um, and very shallow lake and we, um, we sailed across. And then in our second year, we, um, we decided to create this project, which was sort of a fundraiser, a suite of friends that corrected all of the things that went wrong in the first year. So you can see um, the, the, uh, the piece um, in, the, in the, um, the far right, uh, it's, it's Seth and I actually getting Jeffrey Deitch up in, in balloon, with the balloons. Um, uh, this, this piece has been large, is, uh, is, is Seth and I hugging it out because um, we fought endlessly um, across the country. <laughs> so this was us not fighting and, uh, and, you know, loving each other. Like, I'm so glad we never fight. We're best friends. We certainly are, you know, so. Um, and uh, yeah, all of the things that kind of uh, went wrong uh, were corrected in this project. And then in our second year, we also, uh, it was the anniversary of the moon landing. So, um, and we happened to be in Regent, North Dakota uh, during that anniversary. So we uh, reenacted the moon landing for the town of 200 people in Regent. Um, and created this uh, this piece out of uh, found material there. Um, more paintings from the road. And we we went all the way up to Alaska, um, down into Mexico, and kind of everything in between. Um, we lived on very little. So we lived on about, uh, it was about 15 grand a year uh, for all seven of us, um, which was uh, doable because we didn't have any rent. Um, we were basically just paying for food. Um, and, uh, and we would do odd jobs across the country. So, um, so this is a painting about one of the odd jobs I took where it was an ad for, for setting tile. And then I ended up moving uh, logs like all day long for this guy. <laughs> it was like one of these, like the strangest like moments in work uh, on Craigslist. I, uh, another one, another job I picked up uh, doing, building a ramp for this pot belly pig and Uh, yeah, I y'all froze for a second, so I was just making sure. Um, and then we also uh, we worked in a butcher a meat processing plant in Alaska. Um, so this is uh, Seth on the far uh, far left there, on the right, um, and this is the kind of butcher crew. Um, they, uh, you know, we we started what we worked for this place for about a month. And then they um, they were like, you guys are, well, when we first got there, they were like, you guys are really smart. So you guys are going to be on the butcher line. You're not going to make sausage. So we got to learn how to make every kind of uh, cut of meat. Um, not that we really ever used that, uh, that skill anymore, but, but it, it was, it was uh, something kind of interesting to learn at the time. This is Doug who, we actually learned he just passed away at the, at the beginning um, of uh, last year. Um, and he like flew us out. He was awesome. He was the owner of the place. He flew us out onto this, uh, into the middle of nowhere, like um, on this, this puddle jumper plane 
um, and dropped us off where we could like camp for a couple of days. He was an incredible kind of host um, while we worked for him. And we, we, we lived in the bus, so we, we stayed, we kind of camped out near the, um, the, uh, the processing plant and um, yeah, it was an incredible place. And then um, the bus died in Southern California. So uh, we had it towed. Um, this was after we had come back from Alaska and it was, it was clear that the, the trek up because we drove the entire Alaskan highway it um it it was taxing on the bus and it, um, it gave up the ghost just outside of the Salton Sea um, near Slab City, um, which is a another kind of wanderlust uh, space there in Southern California. So we had it towed to to uh, a place that a guy we had met. Um, his name was Container Charlie. He lived out in the middle of the desert. And we had it towed to that spot, and then we had a burial. So we dug a trench and buried it. It's about a 15 degree angle here. And we um, uh, then went into the bus and corrected all the surfaces so you can still use it. So it became sort of a, a part of his compound. Um, um, he's since passed away, and it's uh, it, it now is some other person who's kind of taken over the compound. And uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, went out there not too long ago. And there's definitely been this game of telephone uh, as to what the bus was um, with the kind of board that exists around it. So that's been kind of interesting to see happen. But it's still used, it's used as a space for people to, to stay out there. Um, and I, I threw this in, this is not a project I usually talk about, but um, it was during that time that we were on the bus, uh, someone, I can't remember who it was, but it was, it was someone who worked at the college library uh, asked, asked if we wanted to pitch a project um, that could be on campus um, at the college there. And so uh, we pitched this idea that was gonna be called Suburban Renewal and it was going to be uh, old suburbans that um, we would turn into aquaponic gardens uh, that would live on campus uh, forever. And uh, they, the the admin, was not keen on having these like busted up like suburbans uh, <laughs> living on campus. They asked us. They were like, "So, how long do you think?" Uh, you would want to have the project on campus and we were like forever and they were not having <laughs> um, but it was it was going to be this thing where in the suburban we would uh, create a fish a fish tank um, and then there would be these kind of growing growing centers on the tops and sides and everything but it never came it never came to pass imagine that um <laughs> And then uh, after the bus, we, um, uh, we, my wife and I, we all kind of like dispersed. So, you know, uh, obviously like living for two years in a close, close space with folks um, becomes tense. And so we all dispersed uh, across the country. Um, Joe and Amy, who were also on the bus, they, they uh, went to Texas. Seth and Jamie came back here to South Carolina, and my wife and I uh, crash landed in uh, New Orleans. Um, decided just to come here. Uh, we had a we had a car that we had converted to on vegetable oil as well, and we drove um, drove here from. Uh, we ended up we ended up staying in South Carolina for a little bit, but then drove uh, drove to New Orleans kind of on a whim to, to crash land here. And my first experience there was witnessing this, this uh, crazy car accident where um, this guy in this truck just like plowed into a light pole. Um, was just, it was nuts. And, you know, later on kind of being there, being in the city, I realized how many stationary objects are actually like plowed into in New Orleans. There's just a lot of like 
uh, light poles that are down. Uh, uh, car insurance is very expensive there. <laughs> it's a it's a place where you know uh, one of one of my friends said it's a it's a city that will cater to any of your vices, and uh, and so you know some of some people's vices are uh, you know drinking and driving, and uh, and so it's a lot of uh, a lot of kind of downed objects, and so when we crash landed there. Um, I started working on this project, um, taking all of our moving boxes and using that kind of wreck that I witnessed as a metaphor for our move. So this is a, this is a, you know, a, a life-size kind of recreation of that accident that I, I witnessed. Um, all out of cardboard from the, from the move. Um, at the same time, it was also just like trying to figure out like what what I was wanting to make um, at that at that moment. I ended up buying this um, this sewing machine on Craigslist and uh, could never get it to work. Um, the person the person who I bought it from was uh, he was the husband of the voodoo priestess who married um, uh, Nicholas Cage and. Um, uh, uh, Priscilla Presley, no, not Priscilla Presley, the daughter, well, Lisa Marie. Lisa, so he was the, the husband of this voodoo priestess. But anyways, I bought this thing, could just never get it to work. I got so frustrated, you can see on the side. So I documented, I just documented the trying to fix this thing. And then eventually uh, ended up making a version of the sewing machine so that I could throw it out a window because I was just like, but well, I didn't want to get rid of the sewing machine. I so wanted to just throw the sewing machine itself, but uh, I ended up uh, I ended up fixing it and then giving it away because I was like, I so I couldn't I couldn't do it. Um, and then that wreck piece. I, um, I ended up putting outside on blocks and just letting the kind of environment um, take, take control um, and then uh, redisplayed the piece um, as, as it was uh, once, once people kind of destroyed it. And then from that piece, I, uh, you know, I started seeing like all kind of branding that these uh, boxes and, um, and uh, and the, just the waste that we create, all that brand, all everything branded, all the trash, even the the box that the box comes in is uh, is branded. And so I I created this project, Family Dollar General Tree, um, which was a mashup of the all of the dollar stores, um, and uh, did it did it both at uh, art art fields um, in uh, Lake City. And then this was an installation of it in um, in uh, uh, Art Basel in Miami. Um, these are kind of detailed shots of the of the piece. So it was taking all of the cardboard waste from a dollar store and then translating it back into a dollar store um, as big as I could make it. And then I also had these kind of uh, workshops and um, uh, where people could help me make like toilet paper or uh, Powerade bottles um, and did those at a couple different places uh, across the country. And then this was another uh, wreck that I witnessed um, where this lady who was out of her mind on some kind of drug ended up like plowing into the back of my truck um, with this Saturn. So I, um, I, I did another kind of iteration of the wreck. Um, this one hanging from the ceiling, uh, but again with kind of cardboard. And uh, this was a piece I did. This was kind of one of the earlier pieces with cardboard, but I show it because it, um, it kind of represents how I think of uh, my art practice. It's like the um, kitchen sink of creativity that you're either like you're cleaning the dirty dishes of you know one thing or another but it's all like this kind of it's all in that sink of of dirty dishes 
and it's all kind of work. Um, but this, I mean, th I love this project because uh, I did it and installed it. It was, it, it kind of, you. I dug in the ground and, and installed it outside and it was part of this larger installation. And, and the, the, the dishes were so light that they would blow around the, 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 the lot of this place. So it's sort of like rep, it, it replicated uh, having to like put the dishes back in the sink all like every every day. It was like this annoyance uh, to the to the uh, the people sitting. Um, and in 2010, came back with Seth and we did this project at Redux, um, creating a, a a a town on the outside of the building. Um, we we asked um, all of the artists who were in the space, like what their ideal city would be, and uh, and then we created this um, this uh, ideal city on the outside of the building um, with all of the utilities uh, of of various types. Uh, there was food, electricity, water, uh, sewage, and pornography were the like main utilities. Um, and, uh, and it was this, we came up with this whole like kind of story about these hippies living on the outside of town um, that were trying to take over the city by, uh, by uh, filtering in pornography to all of the, the, all of the residents. And, um, and so that was sort of our, there was this, uh, see on the, the right there, this, um, this missile silo that all of the hippies were living in. So, um, and then I was uh, also started running uh, the art space uh, antenna, um, which actually has nothing to do with transit antenna, but just happenstance that antenna is in both of the names um, did not, uh, yeah, just total coincidence. So antenna started before I uh, moved to New Orleans um, and then I was able to jump in and I was started as a volunteer um, for their annual drawathon, and then um, and then uh, kind of got roped into more and more responsibility throughout the years, um, and then eventually uh, became the director. Um, I was also working as an artist assistant. So this is um, Lynn Emery, and a sculptor there in town who makes these beautiful. Um, uh, kinetic works uh, that spin in the wind. Uh, she is a testament to like uh, studio rigor. She is still going in the studio at like 98 now, uh, still still making work, um, pumping it out. She will till the day she can't, you know? She, she's not gonna stop until she's dead, so. Um, I was teaching, so this was one of my classes at uh, Loyola. Um, and then my wife and I um, also uh, started a bakery in, um, in New Orleans. So it's in Shake Sugary. Um, so we bought a building, did all of this like remodeling and refurbing to the building. Um, that was our, our daughter who's now seven um, uh, while Dawn was working at the bakery there. But, um, but it was this labor of love for, you know, my wife was a pastry chef. And so I helped kind of create the space for her to, to, to make that, make the bakery a reality. Um, we unfortunately had to shutter um, as a result of COVID. It was just like, we couldn't make it work. Um, and uh, it ended up selling the building uh, and moving, moving back to South Carolina, which I'll get into. But this was, these were, this was one of the shows, uh, early shows that I curated at, um, at Antenna. Um, this was uh, uh, there, like right at the, the Mayan in calendar. It was like 2012, I think. Um, when uh, so this was end of days as seen on TV. So uh, all artists who are engaged with um, uh, apocalypse or post-apocalypse prep. Um, so artist projects. Uh, this was. YouTube videos of people showing their like prepping hoard. 
um, which is a big thing. You can check it out on YouTube, like look at people's prep board. It's a very strange, and they just like point at different objects. So it's like, that's my uh, board of GIF peanut butter, you know? Um, and I created a project in collaboration with a local botanist um, that was the, uh, where you could have your, your kind of mobile um, plant um, greenhouse. So this is this, this backpack that I created as a part of that. And it had a, um, a, a, a two liter bottle at the bottom and you could blow in the, blow in the bottle. There's a little blow, uh, uh, pipe that you, you blow in and it, and it, um, would provide water for all the plants. It was a very, uh, uncomfortable backpack. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's just another shot. And I was also making um, paintings um, in New Orleans. So uh, yeah, self-portraits still. Um, and then taking, you know, portraits of, uh, making portraits of uh, friends in their spaces. Really like, I, I was really interested in the sort of like chaos of day to day. Um, also in my own house, is that's of dawn. And then this is a, a, a space that we were staying in in my mom's house, um, the, the kind of chaos of her spaces. Uh, Eric Lind, a woodworker. Uh, Seth again, Seth was staying with us at some at one point and so made this painting of him sleeping on our couch. Um, my son, my son again. in college, about to grad, graduate college. And, uh, and then I started making these like layered paint pieces. Uh, also working on, uh, you know, working in the technique where I wanted to figure out how I could kind of uh, replicate uh, paint, what I do in painting, but uh, in a digital space, um, and then printed these out in, uh, uh, on layered plexiglass. Um, with, and they're backlit with a LED. Again, this is my uh, my mom's uh, space. Uh, my daughter Isabel now, a little older. Devices, sleeping with devices. That's a big thing nowadays. And then the sort of just the chaos of our house. cleaned up their shit a little bit, you know, like maybe you have the, your environments like a little better, or at least you have a Zoom uh, friendly environment, you know, like the, uh, like a wall with which you kind of like put things on and then maybe on the other side, there's still the dirty laundry. Um, and uh, these are images of uh, various projects from Antenna. This is the gallery space on the right. Um, Draw us on the pro project, the 24 hour art making event that um, I started working on the, the working with the organization on. Um, really fun event where it was just uh, 24 hours of making, making things. Um, all artists run. So it was 30 different artists who would come up with crazy workshops and really fun things for people to do. Um, this year, they, I, this past year, they actually did a um, boat version of it where people could come and get packets to, to still do draws on at home. But obviously, it couldn't happen. It would, it would bring together 1,500 people um, to make art uh, throughout a 24 hour period. Um, created Antenna Signals, which is a, um, a, a magazine and a live event series. Um, bringing together artists, writers, thinkers, all on a theme. Um, and, uh, and then we also created these uh, beautiful documentaries uh, of, of artists and creators throughout the city. Um, you can definitely get, you can go check them out on at antenna.works. Um, really awesome documentaries that we got to commission. Um, platforms, which is the granting arm. So we got to give away money um, as a part of the Warhol Foundation. Um, they would give us money to then give away. 
Um, we also got to, in uh, last year, we got to Ways, which was our residency program, we um, uh, took on these ambitious art projects with, um, with artists across the country, um, most notably uh, Dred Scott, uh, re recreating the 1811 uh, slave rebellion, which happened just outside the city. Um, it was the largest uh, rebellion of enslaved people in North American history. Um, it at its height was 500 people. Um, and it had a, the, their, the goal of the, um, the rebels was to create a independent state. Um, and it had a, it had a, a significant chance of, um, of being successful. It ultimately was not, um, I think had, had it been successful it would have really changed US history. Um, but uh, we, we uh, organized this project brought together 500, uh, you know, it was uh, half of the rebellion, so 26 miles um, from La Paz to, to New Orleans. Um, and it, there's a, a beautiful documentary that the Guardian, Guardian newspaper did um, that you can watch online about seven minutes. Um, also did a lot of advocacy work. So uh, this is a project called Fossil Free Fest, um, focused on oil and extractive industries investment in cultural spaces. And um, really like, what does it mean to take oil money at this moment of, uh, of mass shift um, because of climate change? And uh, New Orleans is uh, obviously on the front line of that. Um, a lot of oil and extractive industries there um, in the Gulf. And, um, and so we wanted to, to create a space where we could have dialogue about what this means. And obviously it also meant as our organization, uh, one of the biggest funders in the city is is a uh, oil company, so, um, but there's, you know, there are festivals, so like um, the Jazz Fest, a lot of people know Jazz Fest. The official name of Jazz Fest is the uh, New Orleans uh, Jazz and Heritage Festival presented by Shell. Um, that is the official name of the Jazz Fest. Um, and all of the festivals have that. Um, same kind of official name. There's uh, French Quarter Fest presented by Chevron. And so we wanted to, to create a space where artists could critique and, and, um, and think about what it means to take oil, oil money and, and how that sort of influences creative thought. Um, we also started a project in 2018 called Paper Machine. It's the it's print, print arm of Antenna. And it's a 5,000 square foot uh, print facility. Um, there are artist residencies there, print publications. Um, I was really inspired by my time at the college. As a, I was a print tech. I also taught print for a bit. Um, was in Barber's class. Uh, and um, ultimately, like, did a ton of um, print publications here. It's still going strong. You can apply for a residency there. Um, and create things in print. Um, and then this was our, uh, our COVID response uh, just before I left New Orleans. Um, in, earlier last year, we organized a creative response, which was both granting and, um, and creating these activity kits for families to do um, while they were staying home. So, um, so we uh, used the facilities of paper machine and printed these uh, artist designed activity kits for, for kids. Um, and then distributed them all over the city. Um, we distributed about 15,000 kits uh, throughout uh, the first eight weeks of COVID. Um, and in the lead up to, uh, to Slave Rebellion reenactment, my mom passed away uh, really suddenly. So this is, this is me in that hot sweater. Like, look at that, that pimp sweater. Um, and my mom's there in the middle. These are 
uh, my uh, grandmother and great grandmother, they're, they're all past now. So it's just me and that hot sweater. I don't have that sweater anymore. I would still wear it, I think. But um, because of her passing, uh, I was the only child and um, uh, she had bought this house in Barnwell, South Carolina uh, before she passed a couple of years. It was actually during the housing crisis of so 2008, 2009. She bought this house for 20 grand on credit cards. It's this beautiful old house. Um, and she was like remodeling it uh, up until the day she died. She was like working on this place. And so, uh, you know, once we kind of got through the COVID crisis, at least through the initial stage of COVID, um, it felt like a good time to kind of uh, pass the torch at Antenna. And, uh, and come back and kind of deal with the unwinding of her world. So um, this is the, was the kitchen. Um, and so this, we, we turned it into that. Um, so it's, it was, uh, it was, it was a pretty rough site when we first got there. Um, so kind of turned it into um, using those, uh, the sculpture skills and, um, stuff that I've learned also, uh, you know, throughout the years, like working on houses and stuff. Um, I think the biggest thing in, in being an artist, and uh, whether you're right or not, um, that you can like create something or you can fix something, you can, you can, you, you'll figure it out. And I think that that's the, the, the kind of beautiful side of having a creative practice. This was this is one of the rooms. So she she had a hoarder hoarder's uh, tendency. Um, so I'm going through now and uh, creating kind of new work uh, based on these. Right now I'm just doing these like kind of small drawings of um, of these uh, the objects that are coming out of these this space and. Um, and then I'm going to see where it goes. I don't know what what I'm going to do next, but I'm kind of working on like merging this, continuing this merge of like life and art making and um, and, and yeah, keeping the journey going. And that's uh, where I'm at. And I'm now in South Carolina. I'm in Barnwell most of the time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, yeah. I think we'll uh, open it up to questions. And so uh, if any students here want to ask a question, I can't see all of you right now. So I think it will be best if, if you chat that you want to ask a question and then I can uh, call on people and you can ask directly. Um, and I'll be, uh, for those of you watching on Halsey Live, uh, want to ask a question, use the form right below the video and uh, I'll be asking those as well. So any uh, any questions for Bob? Bob, what was your favorite odd job um, that you worked? You know, we, we saw a few of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think actually, uh, so... For the pot belly pig. Um, that was kind of an awesome gig. Um, uh, the pop belly pig was named Lola, um, and she she was awesome. I also I did a bunch of other work for that for that uh, crew as well. But um, pop belly pig in the middle of um, middle of downtown Portland was, was kind of incredible. I also yeah, I mean working with the kind of crew in uh, Alaska. Um, I mean, any, if if anyone has a chance, like go to Alaska, it's like it's, it's one of the the treasures of the country. Um, you should definitely check it out. Um, be there. I think I, you know, maybe the work was not the best, but uh, being being able to be there was, you know. Yeah. Um, one of the kind of craziest jobs we did, we uh, we took down a. Uh, a a grain side planning project 
we got a gig uh, taking taking this uh, silo down. So it was like um, like there's all of this uh, equipment we've never I never it's very specific to removing a silo <laughs> um, that we got to interface okay. with. Um, and Seth, actually, it was kind of a nuts experience because Seth has asthma and he ended up having this like crazy attack from all of the, the wheat, um, just the, the dust that was uh, left in the, in the silo. So that was, that was a scary moment, but look, fortunately he's okay. Now he has twins. <laughs> um, he, he was able to have kids after that. Perfect. <laughs> Um, do you have a few questions? Uh, real quick, I got a message from Marion Mazzoni. Oh, yes, she, Marion. She writes, she writes, yes, Bob, indeed, I am still the proud owner of I Feel Sick. Also have a Bob in the bag that I treasure. So <laughs> glad to hear that. Um, all right. <laughs> Excellent. Great. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I think Megan has a question. Yeah, I was wondering um, specifically about your early work. You mentioned how comedy played a big part in stand-up comedy. Yes. And I was wondering how that has kind of like gone with your journey of artwork as well and the experience of stand-up comedy in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, uh, I think as I've aged, it's kind of it's waned a bit um, in terms of where where uh, it sort of connects to my work. But, you know, in grad school, I was definitely like, uh, like that, the ATM machine that I created that was uh, pursuing his dream of becoming a stand-up com com comedian, that, that was me. Like I was the ATM machine, no doubt. I, I didn't, I had no interest in, at the time I just didn't want to, be uh, in the art world or an artist or anything. I just wanted to do something else. And that felt like the path that I, I wanted to do. And the ATM machine was, uh, was my, my way of uh, expressing that. Um, but since then I have, it, 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 is, it is woven less into the work. And I think I, I, I like, um, I like the sort of uh, more kind of subtle moments of, um, of chaos and domestic life. And that's where I've kind of focused, focused energy, you know? Cool. Okay. Um, Rachel has a question. Um, I was just wondering when you were traveling um, and doing odd jobs, how you found the time to like make work or even have the space for work. Um, I feel like if I was around all those people, I would have probably some um, issues creating so I didn't know like what kept you going or inspired you to keep creating yeah so um we uh we were fortunate when we traveled that we didn't you know we were we were running on waste vegetable oil so it didn't cost us a lot to travel I think now like you could travel you it's feasible to to do something all electric which is amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, as that becomes more available, I think that that's going to be incredible. Um, I think that also we just, all of us want, like, we wanted to make things as we were moving across the country and kind of document our experience. So um, Seth, who was uh, with us, he, he was also creating like films. Um, uh, little mini films that, uh, that ultimately, like now he's a, he's more of a filmmaker than a painter um, and is doing a, a lot of documentary film as a result of that. Um, Jamie, who was on the bus she, at the time, she was doing a lot of uh, uh, writing, like documentary write, writing. So writing these articles about our kind of trek across the country. Um, and now she's, uh, she's one of the lead editors at the state newspaper in South Carolina here. So, um, so that, it, you know, that work kind of, it, it, that, that time like influenced how we kind of kept, kept moving. Um, and find, you know, finding the time, I mean, we would, we would do, we would stop at a lot of uh, art spaces across the country. Um, 
Uh, so like the print series that we created, that was at a place, I think it was in uh, Martinburg, South Carolina. The, um, uh, I forget what that space is called now, but uh, Hub, Hubbub is I think the residency that's there. Um, but we stopped there and kind of hung out with people and just uh, set, set up a, a ad hoc kind of silkscreen space to make those. Um, we did it all on the bus. It was not, I mean, I think that that's why we, we also gave ourselves like a, um, a, a, an expiration date on the project because um, we, kn we knew that um, we, we, we couldn't last longer than two years and we barely lasted two years. It was actually, it was great that the bus died because I think we, we could have, there could have been a murder on the bus um, in some capacity. We were not, we like Seth and I were fighting a lot. And actually, um, uh, after and still are. But like at that moment was like, we needed, we needed a break um, from one another. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think that Again, it's like seeing your art practice is not just making paintings or making drawings. You know, it's like an extension of your kind of world. So, like, you know, creating the inner space of the of the um, bus was as much about like our practice as the as creating paintings. You know, so so we were always also working on the space. We we created this like pedal power machine um, at the in the passenger seat where you could pedal this motor and it would power the batteries. It never really worked right, but it looked really cool. Um, and we also had this like uh, uh, swamp cooler thing that I, I convinced that we could create a swamp cooler and cool down the bus, but it was it never worked. Um, right, but it was like these these projects of uh, creating kind of a, a creatively solving things that was also exciting. So, did that answer your question? Because I missed some of it. You broke up. I, yeah, I feel like it, I feel like it did. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. All right, next will be Tristan. Hi. Um, so I actually worked at. All right, interned at Redux last semester. And um, I really kind of like want to go into what Redux is like all about and like having like a arts management organization. Um, is there any tips that you could tell me about like getting that started? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think, um, uh, uh, you, I, it depends on what you're wanting to, to do. Um, you know, if you're wanting to uh, create a space um, or, you know, a residency program, like what is it you want to do? Um, well, I really like just having, well, I really am interested in like curating works. Like I like how right now in the front gallery, they're doing kind of like um, just shows for different artists, but they're also doing like, they have that and then they have the, the back like 40 studios for other artists that they can hold. Um, yeah. I don't know, I just really, that kind of community and like, just like their mission is just, I just really like respect it. Yeah, well, there's, so there's, um, there's a, a network of organizations um, that are similar to the Redux across the field. Um, I was one of the like founding uh, organizers of that kind of entity. Um, it's commonfield.org is the website. Um, and uh, it's, it's a network of about, I think it's like at this point, like 700 members of like different spaces of all different types um, uh, all over the country. You know, it can, it, it's, you know, uh, small like curatorial projects um, to uh, spaces similar to Redux. Um, 
and uh, that they have a convening every year. Um, this last year they did it online. I suspect that they'll probably do it again this year online. So it's a good opportunity to kind of see what um, what projects are are happening. Um, if you're interested in uh, curation specifically, there are uh, there are curatorial um, uh, like, there's like a curatorial residency I think in Kansas. Um, uh, the, if you look up curatorial residency, there's uh, there is also one in uh, New Orleans called Farce um, that could be a potential um, uh, program. I, the parse one I don't think is open application, but I think the one in Kansas is. So you could apply to to be a, a resident curator um, at this program. But also, just like I think getting started, just do you know, I with with Redux, for instance, like come up with a show that you want to put together that's of like local artists and pitch it to them. You know, like spaces like Redux game to host uh, uh, guest curators and guest programs. So, you know, they're, they're going to be game, you know, I, there's no guarantees, obviously, but like a lot of spaces like that are, are game to, to have folks um, pitch ideas. Um, and particularly now in kind of COVID moments where it's like, um, it's programming is, is slim, like if you're wanting to, to kind of pitch something that's like local, that's low cost for the organization, you know, it's, it's a good, uh, good move to do that. So like, if you're looking, you know, if it's artists that you're excited about in the city or regionally excited, like I, that's, that would be a good beginning because a lot of these programs, like the, the curatorial residency programs, for instance, you have to have some kind of like track record of doing the thing, right? Like you have to show, show like images that you've done and often it's the best place to start is just to do your own thing and make it happen so um the you know often with a lot of uh artists run or self-initiated things it's going to be you're, you're going to start with no money so like don't don't think that you're going to get a grant to do it it's going to be zero dollars it always is so you gotta like be scrappy and resourceful in making the thing happen. And then once you have a track record, often you can start to get resources. So, you know, in our first, you know, I showed images of some of the things I was creating um, in the early years of Redux. We were doing these like art auctions. We were doing cheap art auctions. So we were selling, we were making like, you know, uh, we would sit and like make a bunch of stuff to auction off and then we would auction it off and make like a couple of money and we'd do it again, you know? It was whatever we could kind of like come up with to raise funds. Um, and yeah, like I said, the some of the things were more successful than others. People didn't want to buy like nude self-portraits. So, you know, maybe make make things that aren't that <laughs> um make objects that you could sell and um it, yeah i mean that was you know now the redux art auctions like a big core part of their kind of fundraising but um earlier on it was we were just like you know doing that as a at, to get things going so we would make like it would be like tops like four grand i think is what we would make at an art auction um, and it kind of kept things going. And then we we built it up to the point that we could get grants, start doing grant writing and and uh, and it's all like grants always want you to have some kind of track record. So you gotta like figure out like be scrappy and resourceful for those like first few years in order to prove that you want to stick around so that you can get those resources. Cool. Um, that was a good answer. Um, I think next we have Barbara. Hi, Bob. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, this wasn't my original question, but I'm wondering what age are you, what age are you going to start your humorous memoir? 
of your the events in your life. It seems like you have a lot of good stories you can share with the world, especially with other artists and what you went through in a very humorous manner. So if you haven't got another project on hand, you might want to start start that up. So I enjoyed yeah. your stories. But my question really was, you know, you started as an artist very young, it seems like in your life. You kind of knew where you were going. And, you know, sometimes it takes a while for us to figure that out. What, as you were going through and doing this stuff, as you were doing your art, what was your biggest challenge as an artist, as living the life of an artist, besides the financial um, challenge? Yeah. 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 I mean, I know you saw, I saw you working in all kinds of media. I saw you working in all kinds of, you know, sculpture and then, you know, public art and painting and sketching and inks. And I'm going, you know, was there something that you loved that you, you know, or did you just, and printing and everything, you're just like a renaissance man, you know, kind of thing. That's what I saw. So I was wondering what the, cha- if there was a, a challenge, really a big challenge for you, or was a turning point someplace in your life up till now? It might be one later, but I don't yeah. know up till now. I mean, I think that the, the biggest thing um, was, uh, was being able to embrace failure. Like, I think that that's um, something, you know, when you have a, like an idea or kind of a goal and, uh, and then it doesn't work out and it feels like it's the total, like end of the world, like the, the project with, uh, with Seth, where we, we tried to lift Jeffrey Deitch with balloons, that was like up to that point was like our biggest flop failure of a thing. And I think like before then, it never, ne- I never worked it into kind of my practice as like, like owning or like letting failure just exist in a piece, you know, like it could be like a small failure or a big one. But like, I think that that's, you know, there was obviously like there, there was the, the kind of, um, owning those, those personal failures. Um, but then the professional ones, um, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't the same. It like felt like, you know, like the painting had to be like perfectly tight or the project had to be like, you know, uh, every, every, you know, edge had to be rounded. And, um, and I think that that was kind of the biggest thing of like really owning failure. Um, and, and being okay with it, you know, like, like I just leaving New Orleans, I like, I just totally kind of blew up my career as an art admin to just go deal with unwinding my mom's world. And I just have to be okay with that. Like, if that's a, I don't know that that's a failure. Some people might see it that way, where it's just like, well, you you just like, you were on this track to do this other thing. I mean, we created this with uh, Dred's projects, um, the Slave Rebellion reenactment. It was the largest project I've ever worked on. You know, I obviously wasn't involved, but I poured like so many hours into like making that project happen. It's a, a project that's over a million dollars. I uh, raised all of that money <laughs> with in in collaboration with Dread, and um, and then uh, you know, and it was a project that was bigger, like the operating budget is bigger than our organization, so it felt like such a a success in a lot of ways. And then kind of to to wind into this kind of personal world, I think could feel like a failure. But I'm a, I'm totally I'm I'm game for it. Like I want to see where it goes. Like the uh, kind of taking on and and really kind of being uh, I, I honestly like when my mom passed it was in the lead up to that project and I just had no time to kind of work work through what happened you know like because it was very sudden she was 62 very young like it was just it was all like and it was all in this chaos of like working on that project and then just like it's time to like come back and kind of unwind her world and see where that project goes. And, and it'll be something else. It'll be, it, it, it'll be, you know, the, the project that I showed first um, uh, about 
uh, my dad giving giving her gonorrhea. She hated that project. So uh, <laughs> she hated it. And so I feel like I feel like I need to do something that um, that honors her in a in a way that um, and I don't know where that's where it's going to go. You know, you know, I think some of the best art and some of the best stand up comedy comes from failure. So I think we, you're on the right track. I think. Yeah. So hang in there. And I, I enjoyed those pictures. I, I thought they were funny, too, but I was afraid nobody was laughing or anything. So I just, <laughs> OK, I yeah. just thought they were crazy. OK, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. All right. Next is Brooke. And then I do have a one from Nandini that we'll get to after that from Halsey Live. So go okay. ahead, Brooke. Thank you. Hi, Robert. Um, I just have a quick question on, I guess, in relation to grad school. <laughs> yeah. um, I was accepted into grad school and it's an exciting opportunity, but I'm not sure really what I want, where I want to go with it. If I want to go, if I want to do it, my parents are pushing me to do it, but it's hard. Um, so I was just wondering like what your pros and cons were to it and any, just your two cents, what you have to say about it. <laughs> um, uh, well, I was, just, I was actually just talk, talking to Sarah Frankel about this um, earlier today. Um, you know, I, I had, a, I had a, a, a tumultuous kind of experience in grad school, um, but you'll have that, everyone does. Um, I, uh, I do feel like, I, I mean, I still owe every penny that I, uh, that, that tuition costs, uh, in grad school, I've been paying it on income-based, uh, repayments and still owe all of it. So, um, cause I had, uh, under, undergrad debt. So, I mean, I would recommend, you know, a program that pays you. Uh, if that's possible, you know, like if you can, if you can get out of a uh, school without debt, um, especially a program that can, that gives you that time uh, to make work. Um, that's, you know, that's why you're there. Um, it is good to though, to have like incredible faculty that, um, that you're working with. So, you know, if the school, if, if you're excited about the artists that are there at the school, what's the school that you're, you're, you've been accepted to. Sorry, um, I got into SCAD for fibers and textiles. So I wanna go more into design and textile design rather than like more traditional painting or drawing. So I don't know, I've kind of been told like in the design world and the textiles and fibers world, grad school is really helpful and that SCADA has a pretty good program for that. So it is exciting, but I mean, COVID is uncharted territory. So it just yeah. changes everything. So I'm just kind of trying to get any sort of input from people who know a lot more than me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I really recommend, there are some really schools that pay you. So, you know, that where you're, you know, you'll get like 15, 20,000 a year. It's not, you're not gonna live like a king or anything, but you will be able to survive. I mean, one of them's uh, Tulane in New Orleans. Uh, they have a paid, res or paid uh, MFA program. You know, there are others like Ohio State or others that exist out there. Um, and textiles, I'm not, I'm not so sure uh, what the programs are that are out there, but I would look at that, um, as, it, you know, if that's your only option, because I know that SCAD's not going to be free. You're going to be paying for that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that for us, uh, when uh, when we graduated from undergrad, some of the like best experience for us was taking the time to run an organization for a couple of years, and taking that space and getting getting to know the kind of landscape of uh, art spaces um, across the country, like really was helpful for us. Um, both myself and uh, some of the other founders of Redux. Um, before we went off to grad school, we all uh, ultimately all of us went to school in some capacity. Um, but it it was uh, it was really informative to to get that kind of um, that knowledge. And then, I mean, at this point in COVID time too, it's like, will hopefully they'll have normal 
classes by the end of this year, but it's unknown. So it might be helpful for you to, to take that time, you know, and orient yourself. So. Yeah, I, um, last week I decided to defer until at least next spring because okay. I figured with COVID and especially for textiles and fibers, I don't think I would get the full experience, like as hands-on as I would without a pandemic. So, um, yeah. At least I, I think I have some time and space to think about it and explore different options, but it's always nice to hear other people's opinions. So thank you. I really appreciate it. For sure. Yeah. And um, so I've got a question from Nandini um, from Halsey Live. She writes, did you have a project in your early career that ended up uh, exceedingly more successful than you expected? Um, oh. Good question. Kind of the opposite of what Barbara was asking. Yeah, so yeah. What, what worked out better Best. than you thought? Oh, man. Actually, um, you know, Redux was actually, is, is one of those projects where it's like, uh, I honestly, like when we left, we thought of it like it was going to, dissipate just because um it was it was so it was so tumultuous at that at that moment and and it was also like an exodus of a, a big chunk of the folks who had started it um and i think that what you know, what it what what it taught us is that you know like we are not the be all end all <laughs> to a thing you know like there is a continuum and uh, things will exist, you know, before and after us. So, um, but it, it yeah, that was that's definitely one of the the bigger bigger successes um, of the early career. It's still going. Um, they've moved yeah. to other spaces. I have nothing to do with it. I think that that's the biggest success. Is like when no one no one is making a phone call to to the person who started it. <laughs> That's, that's Yeah, that's a good sign for sure. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, well, any last questions from anyone here? Or I think that's not related to art. Sure. Okay, go for it. Um, what's your favorite place you went to in Alaska? Oh, uh, so we stayed in this, um, we didn't get to do a lot of Alaska. We only stayed in that, you know, there's like Alaska's like this big, thin, big state. And then there's like this little tiny part in the bottom, Yeah. Where, you know, where, where it's like the, all of the major roads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, like, we're in, like, yeah, it's like Anchorage and, and, um, Stewart, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like all the kind of like major, major cities. So we stayed mostly there, but then we were able to, um, we went to Nali um, National Park, which is incredible. Um, uh, definitely, you know, I recommend going there. It's also crazy to see like uh, the, the guy who like died in, in, in the Into the Wild, um, that, that book and movie, like how close that guy was to like a ranger station is like so nuts like to like see how it's, it's crazy so that that's a beautiful like um uh part of the world and then we also stayed at this um so the we were in indian alaska which is uh just outside of um uh fairbanks and um that was where we we uh we were working for the meat processing plant and um, uh, uh, Doug, who owned it, flew us out to this place called Trapper Joe's Cabin. It's like a place you can only get to by plane. Um, and uh, that we stayed there for like a week, and that was just a, it was on its own little lake and just fished for trout to eat. Um, and uh, yeah, incredible part. I like, it, but any part of of Alaska. I mean. We really wanted to do the um, the uh, the ferry up the coast because um, you can take all of the you can go to all the islands along the coast 
Um, but we were in a 40 foot transit bus and they charge you by foot. Um, so it was going to cost us like four grand to like go on the ferry to like up, up the coast. So we drove it instead because we could, we could do it for free on waste oil. So, but I, I, you know, that, that is a, a really awesome, uh, trek, um, the ferry ride because you leave from, uh, Bellingham, Washington, and you can camp out on the deck of the, of the ferry. Um, and you, I just like a like trek up the coast um, really incredible so do that if you can awesome yeah thank you yeah all right anyone else cool well um i think that'll wrap it up for us tonight um th thanks so much bob um it was really great to hear um your whole story and uh, obviously wish you the best of luck um, with your new adventure in Barnwell here. Um, yeah, and I, I know Bob's you know, been through all the works and we're super excited with uh, how the show is turning out. So thanks again, Bob, for joining us tonight. And as a reminder, Young Contemporaries 2021 will open on Friday, March 26th. And uh, please join us on Instagram Live um, that day at 5 p.m. We'll have the opening reception and an award ceremony as well. So um, yeah, so thanks to Bob, thanks to the studio art department and to all of our students here. Um, but other, any, otherwise, uh, have a good night, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Uh, uh, Bob, is Bob still there? Uh, Bob left, it looks like.